um, in this video I will make a comment, a chronological <coughs> comment of the first, the first 33 minutes of the video uh, titled The Hegelian Wound by Slavoj Zizek, which apparently was published in 2013, which is still available on the internet. I will put the link down below. And I will put the structure of the video, which follows the chronological order of the video by Slavoj Zizek. And I've guessed that as of now, if you watch this video, you are interested in Zizek, but I will speak directly to Slavoj Zizek. Maybe he will never watch this video, I don't know, but I will speak directly to Slavoj because we live in an age where anyone can talk directly to anyone else with an internet connection. <clears throat> and I will begin by uh, sharing some thoughts about Slavoj Zizek. I think that he's some sort of a modern day Jesus in a sense that he shares very complex, very speculative, mostly Hegelian ideas uh, with the masses, mostly leftist people, not only, but the, most of the followers of Zizek are leftist and leaning towards communism, radical leftists. And he tries to make these complex, very complex ideas intelligible by using examples from uh, arti the artistic history of, of Western Europe, but also uh, political illustrations in, in the modern uh, globalized world, or, or even extracts from pop culture. And honestly, I believe that Slavoj Zizek, although he is depicted and, and perceived by, by those who follow him as a very charismatic, very comical, very intelligent man, and of course he is charismatic, comical, and very intelligent, but I think that I understand him, uh, not fully, but I understand a lot about him, and I think that deep within he suffers greatly. Uh, he's a tormented soul, although he believes that he has no soul, that he's just a, a collection of, of atoms, because he's a materialist, but uh, he's a very conflicted person because he, he, he explores the most complex uh, speculative depth of, of some of the greatest minds like Hegel and, and even uh, Walter Benjamin and he, he, he read I think Schelling um, he's familiar with Marx who whatever one might say was a great thinker and um, he's a profoundly Christian thinker, although he claims to be an atheist, but he keeps talking about Christianity. And um, I just had a, a thought about the entity that we call God before commenting the video. And I said to myself that uh, it is a possibility that God as, as an infinite thinking entity might suffer from an excess of of intelligence and that God tends to overcomplicate uh, thinking and that God suffers from his own complexity and I believe that Slavoj Zizek is made in the image of God like every human but maybe he's more divine than others because he suffers from over complexification of thinking and he's a profoundly speculative man, as Hegel would say, but he doesn't understand speculative thinking yet because he hasn't had any direct intimate connection with the divine, but he comes close to the experience, I guess. And uh, I think that he suffers from being seen as some sort of a clown because what people love about Zizek is when he talks about sex and, and about uh, making jokes and 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 about uh, overthrowing the capitalists. People enjoy sex and violence when they, <laughs> when, when they hear talk about Zizek, but he's, he's a, a much deeper thinker than just that. And I believe that he suffers because most of the people to which he talks to do not really understand him. When he makes 
very uh, complex references to Hegel in very specific passages of the work of Hegel, how many people in the audience understand what he says? Not many. So, yeah. Um, I will begin the systematic comment um, by talking about uh, what he says in the video, the Hegelian wound. Uh, of course, he's an anti-colonialist uh, because he's a leftist, but he's more subtle than most leftists. And he says that the Indians uh, of India complain about the, the fact that they have partly lost their native language because the English, through colonization, have imposed their own language upon them. And I understand that it is a source of complaint from the part of those who have been deprived of their native language, but uh, if we adopt a European perspective, uh, the French, for instance, have been deprived of their native language, which was Celtic probably, uh, by, by the Roman colonization, which was ruthless and brutal and violent. And the French, the ancestors of the French, which were not even French, they were the Gauls, they were, um, they were enslaved and slaughtered and oppressed. And what am I saying? It was 2000 years ago, whereas India, it was only 200 years ago. So the wound, the Hegelian wound, is more present and hurts more, which might be true. But there's this idea that uh, the peoples of Europe have also been partly deprived of their native language in some parts of Europe. And uh, he says that the people who were colonized by a foreign, foreign language and a foreign culture and a foreign people have experienced a feeling of loss that they have been deprived of something and, and that they are on a quest to re-establish this identity. But this movement of this intellectual and cultural movement of experiencing loss and having the will to re-establish uh, the identity with that which has been lost is the movement of Hegel's philosophy. And I can illustrate my point by making reference to the right-wing European perspective. Uh, there are white Americans in the United States of America who feel that they are experiencing, the, the, they, they are missing Europe, that they vaguely experience the idea that having come to America, not themselves, but their ancestors, was a mistake and that they have lost their, their, their homeland, which is Europe, and that they, they want to re-establish their European identity. And we are witnessing in this modern day and age a, a re-establishment, a rebuilding, a reconstructing process of the European pagan identity in Europe, but also in the, the, the white countries or predominantly white countries like the United States of America. So there are white Europeans who experience this feeling of loss. And uh, yeah. Uh, then Zizek talks about the untouchables in India, among whom, he says, he has many friends. And I am not yet familiar with the situation in India, and I can imagine that it is very difficult for the untouchables to, to be cast aside and left aside and, and uh, being rejected. But then again, I will adopt the perspective of, of Europe uh, the untouchables in the modern West are the right-wing nationalist white Europeans. They are considered socially untouchable because uh, they are considered filthy, their ideas are filthy, they are poisonous, they are dangerous, they are contagious, uh, they are evil, they are malevolent, and, and the, the right-wing Europeans who defend their identity are considered untouchable in, in our societies and they are, when they express their ideas publicly, they are rejected by um, the establishment, they, they, they do not have access to job opportunities, they have to face criticism, mockery, um, scorn, insults, 
or they are banned from the internet, from the public website, etc., etc. So of course, it's not as bad as the material conditions of the untouchable in India, but it's a social rejection. And, and, and if Zizek was aware of that, he would be now, he would adopt a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, he says that having been cut off from one's roots is an opportunity, a chance for freedom, an opportunity to reestablish freedom. And in the philosophy of Hegel, freedom is the identity of the self and the not-self in the realm of consciousness, of the, the I and the you. When the I becomes equal to the you in the realm of spirit, when, when the self recognizes itself outside of itself, this is spirit. And freedom, from a Hegelian perspective, can only occur because separation has already occurred. So, in order for spirit to liberate himself from his finite existence and to become infinite, he must have previously been cut off from himself. So, yeah, and our roots as human thinking consciousnesses, there is only one root. Uh, it, it is God. It is our spiritual home. And every thinking human is unconsciously seeking to reestablish its identity with God. Uh, yeah. He says that the, the kind of arrogant, white, conservatives or leftists, he doesn't uh, precise uh, who he's talking about, says that uh, they think in their Western perspective that uh, all the poor in India, they are much wiser than we imperialist Western uh, civilization. Um, they have more, there is more wisdom in a poor Indian peasant than in an English manager, I am quoting more or less his words, but and then he, he talks about the, the fascination that the arrogant Westerners, in his view, have for the so-called primitive cultures of, for instance, the Bushmen, the Hottentots, or, or the, the, the culture of the native Indians, because in the perspective of these Western whites, these people have kept a unique and preserved a unique and specific cultures. They worship the spirits of the earth, uh, kind of an, an animism um, uh, that uh, they, they live in some sort of a, a spiritual unity with nature. And Zizek says that this is a fake respect, that it is inverted racism. So Zizek criticizes the liberal white Western leftists who have this fantasized view of the so-called less developed, less civilized people, and he accused them of being racist. And he, it's partly true because it's partly hypocritical, but what Zizek doesn't know is that in the right-wing pagan white European circles, there are very intelligent people, uh, right-wing nationalist Europeans, who sincerely envy and admire the culture of the primitive peoples. There is a tendency rising among the right-wing circles in Europe to, to admire and to envy the spiritual unity, uh, the, the, the primordial wholeness, the primordial living harmony with nature that these people who have not yet completely lost their culture to Western imperialism still do enjoy, or at least that's why they envision. So this is a mirror game in the sense that the white liberal leftists are hypocritical and probably unconsciously racist when they when they praise these uh, uh, people who, according to them, still live in harmony with nature and with the spirits of the earth. But the, the counterpart of the white liberal leftists is the right wing um, nationalist Europeans, and they have a sincere, they are not lying, they, they really miss this spiritual unity with the substance. And this is what Hegel talks about in the, in the beginning of the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, when he says that um, there is a will among, among 
our consciousness to re-establish a substantial unity with the whole of being. And, and people are suffering from having been uprooted, separated, differentiated from this substantial unity with the presence of the divine within the whole of being. Yeah. Um, then he develops a very profound, very speculative idea. He says that in the case of these Indians who complain about colonization, and they have good reasons to complain, but he says that they dream to get back, to get back to a situation prior to the colonization of the English, before the colonization. But according to Zizek, what they want to return to has nothing to do with pre-colonial India. Uh, that this pre-colonial India was, according to him, neither good nor bad. It was a heterogeneous mess. And I will put a link to a song by Eminem when he talks about a Rubik's, uh, a beautiful mess. It can help enlighten uh, the perspective. Um, and he says, what we are returning to in the view of this anti-colonial um, activist, what we are returning to is something which emerges from this very return. It appears that we are returning to something, but we are creating this something through the very return to it. And this is the formal movement that in some other of his videos, Zizek says that we must return to Hegel. But Zizek suffers from the same delusion than the delusion that he blames on these anti-colonialist Indian activists, that he believes that we are returning to Hegel. But the Hegel to which Zizek wants to return to uh, is a new Hegel, which will emerge from the process of returning to Hegel. And this is what I call cultural Hegelianism. It is a return to Hegel. But we will not find good old Hegel. Uh, by returning to Hegel, we will find a new Hegel. And we will discover that this new Hegel was good old Hegel. That's very speculative. It appears that we are returning to Hegel after having fallen, in the, in the view of, of Zizek, from Hegel to Marx, it was the fall, and now we have to return to uh, the Garden of Eden, which is the writings of good old Hegel, but we are creating Hegel by returning to Hegel. This is a very speculative idea, and I'm not sure that many people at this moment can understand. And I will put a link to uh, an extract uh, from the TV show Lost, a famous scene where ja Jake, Jack, Jack, Jack and Kate meet, and, and Jack says to Kate, we must go back, basically. He's kind of desperate, he wants to go back. He wants to, to lose himself in Hegel, maybe, I don't know. Uh, then he says that Hegel makes uh, a wonderful point, and credit must be given to Hegel. Hegel often makes wonderful points, not always, but even when Hegel is wrong, I guess he's right. Uh, he says that the, 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 the work of art that he mentions, the, the Argos statue, is, is a statue on which every surface is an eye staring back at you. And there is a play on world, a play on word in the English language. And if I have to make a connection with what Zizek says at the beginning of the video, I am not a native speaker of English. So England is the, 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 the language of the empire, so to speak. And, and so does Zizek. So I speak English because the English dominates the world culturally and politically and economically. The English, I mean, the Anglo-Saxon, the Anglo-Saxon countries. And so he said, every surface of the statue is an eye, but the eye can be the eye through which I see and the eye, which is the self, like I am. It can, it can be both. And the world uh, is the mirror of God. And every eye, every self, 
is a, a self which stares back at God and through which God can contemplate himself and through which the self can contemplate God. This is the philosophy of Hegel, this reciprocal looking at one another and trying to recognize one another as being modes of the one infinite substance, to talk like Spinoza. This is Hegel's philosophy. Then he says, there's uh, Hegel's famous saying that uh, it's not, that's Zizek talking. Zizek says, this is not the, the usual stupidity that spirit plays a game with itself. So Zizek says that this is stupid to believe that Hegel's philosophy consists in saying that spirit plays a game with itself. But this is exactly what Hegel says. I don't know what, what Zizek understand uh, when he reads Hegel because he's a very intelligent man, so I, I don't understand how he can not understand. He says, uh, you alienate yourself, then you reappropriate your otherness. He says that you have to recognize in the wound itself the solution, uh, the wound of God and of humans. Uh, and of every thinking consciousness is the negative because the negative is the cause of all suffering so maybe the negative is the solution to its own suffering which means in this Zizekian perspective that to negate the negative is the way to achieve the positive but Hegel already knew this uh, yeah um He says that Hegel is a great partisan of the fall. The fall itself creates the good from which it is the fall. And if I wanted to make a joke with the English language, I would remove the O from the word good and I would say fall itself creates the God, not the good, the God from which it is the fall. Honestly, I, th I think it's a very good joke. Uh, Maybe it will become famous one day, I don't know. But the English language is, is very uh, adequate to make jokes. I understand why Shakespeare was such a good writer, maybe, because the English language is, is not very apt to make speculative thoughts, but to play with words, that's a very good tool. <laughs> um, he says that fall itself creates that from which it is the fall. Uh, but I would like to say to Slavoj that we are fallen. We are fallen creatures. Um, and by saying that the fall uh, was what's the word that I could use that an opportunity Hegel is kind of an anti-Christian thinker because he defends the idea of the fall. But Hegel is also a very Christian thinker. And Hegel is the thinker which says that something and its opposite are one in the mind of the speculative thinker. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And he says that you first lose a thing and through its loss, the thing emerges from you and then you can try to regain it. And I made a video on this channel a, a few weeks ago in which I said that the motto of Donald Trump, make America great again. This is a very Hegelian motto because it means that America has fallen from grace and from greatness in the mind of Donald Trump and his followers, and that it now must re-establish its former greatness. But in order to re-establish the greatness of America, America has to understand why it, it has fallen from greatness. And in the mind of those people, the great America was in the 1950s, basically. So if you inquire into the reason why America has fallen, you have to investigate about the leftist revolution the Cultural Revolution, that which we call Cultural Marxism mostly, which has shaped 
uh, America and the Western world since the 1960s. And the real meaning of this motto is make Hegel great again. And, and Zizek has understood. When he says we must return to Hegel, Zizek could make a video in, in saying, let us make Hegel great again. But the real meaning is God, uh, let, let us make God great again, or, or God has to make himself great again. And it is only through the consciousness of the loss, from the separation, from the alienation, the, 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 the loss of the primordial unity, which maybe did never exist, even maybe it's a delusion, but it's a delusion which creates movement and the will to re-establish this delusional primordial unity and um, the will to go back is that which drives the movement forward. And Hegel knew this. It's at the very beginning of the science of logic. He says that every step forward is a regression towards the beginning. So to move forward or to move backward uh, is the same thing. That's why uh, in the mind of the right-wingers, to be a reactionary is to be a progressive. And in the mind of, of also the right-winger, to be a progressive means to be uh, a reactionary. So, yeah. And then he talks about the Kabbalah uh, by Isaac Luria, saying that uh, the world is some sort of a broken vessel and that God is or was, I don't know, this infinite formless being, I guess, without purpose. And uh, that this infinite, formless, purposeless being, I guess, uh, wants, for lack of a better word, to fill the, the nothing, which is this being, with something. So by talking about the Kabbalah, Zizek is, is, is recreating the beginning of Hegel's science of logic. So, yeah. Uh, then he says that the vessel in the mind of the Kabbalah or maybe of Walter Benjamin who was a Kabbalist maybe I don't know which is creation is shattered uh, and we humans should help God through a spiritual exercise to try to reshape or reform or rebuild or uh, or repair uh, the shattered uh, broken creation and I will put a link to a song by Linkin Park Castle of Glass which says um, show me how to be whole again and in my view modern pop culture is the manifestation of absolute spirit so uh, Zizek is a Kabbalist and he's a Christian and he's a Hegelian. So he understands pretty much everything about pretty much everything, except that I, I keep saying this every time I make a video about Zizek, but he doesn't understand that God uh, exists. And maybe my mission uh, is to, to help Zizek uh, realize that God is real. Yeah. I don't know if Slavoj, you will watch my videos someday. But if you do, I guess it will be the, the most strange, the weirdest, maybe the most amazing, who knows, uh, experience ever. Because the more I listen to your videos and, and explore your ideas, uh, the more I believe that God is more than amazing, it's uh, I am left speechless. Uh, and I don't know who created you, Slava. I don't know if it's Hegel or God, uh, but whoever created you was pretty brilliant because Truth be told, you, you are a pretty brilliant image of God, I must admit. Uh, yeah. And then you talk or he talks about 
the problem of translation in the view of Walter Benjamin with the, the opposition of the original word, the original work or word, the original book, which is, according to him, the real thing, and then the translation whose purpose is to try to recapture the spirit of the original, but in the view of Walter Benjamin, explained by Zizek, both the original and the translation are fragments of the same totality. And uh, the relationship between the original word and a translated word or work is uh, still a mystery to me, but I am starting to understand that in order to understand Hegel, one has to read Hegel in German. And um, the Muslims know that in order to understand the Quran, one has to read the Quran uh, in, in Arab. And uh, the German philosophers probably all knew that in order to understand the Greek philosophers, one had to read them in Greek. Uh, but precisely, Zizek tells us that this idea that the original must be distinguished from the translation it's probably what Hegel would call a distinction of der Verstand, which is abstract, one-sided thinking, and that one cannot be thought of without the other, so that speculative thinking consists in grasping the unity of both. Probably Hegel would say something like that. And, uh, yeah, so there's this idea that the original is a fragment. And um, this is the classical Hegelian triadic movement, abstract, negation, concrete. The original, in the view of Walter Benjamin and Zizek, the original would be the abstract moment. It would, it would lack uh, completeness, so it needs its own negation, which is the translation. To translate is to negate, uh, but to negate the abstraction from which we begin with. And the truth is neither the abstract nor the negation, but the unity of both, which is what Hegel calls concrete, which is the truth. So maybe in order to understand a book, one needs to read its translation. So maybe the native speaker of Germans should learn a foreign language to read the science of logic uh, in English or in French so that they might understand the, the German original word. That, that would be quite comical. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, yeah, so he says that the ultimate lesson of Christianity is to celebrate the breaking of the vessel. That's a difficult idea. To, to defend because it is the negative who broke the vessel and to celebrate the negative I'm not sure that's a very Christian ID I, I, I don't know but uh, maybe someday Zizek will celebrate the negative I don't know but uh, yeah that's what I had to say but um, Slava Zizek is still a mystery to me because He's so profound in his thinking that uh, I do not understand why he does not understand himself. So, yeah. <clears throat>